another model, which is called the probing model, which Sebastian told about, which was introduced in 2003 by Ishai, Sayai, and Dagna. And luckily for us, these two models are really related. So I'm going to show you the probing model. It's very simple. It's very similar to this one. But there you get a much stronger attacker, which actually probes the value. So instead of getting noisy information about what's going on in the card, he actually gets the true value that is being manipulated, pure information. So it's much more simpler to, uh, to apprehend. And luckily for us, there was a work uh, two years ago by Duke et al. that showed that if you have an implementation that is secure in this model, then it's also secure in the, secure, uh, in the noisy leakage model for a certain amount of noise. So what this means is that if you say something in this model, which is very convenient to work in, you are also saying something that is relevant in the other model, which is more practical. So this being said, we are going to focus on the probing model in this work. So the key idea, once again, in the probing model, when you want to uh, prevent an attacker to get information about your sensitive value, is that you want to mask your sensitive value. So to do so, once again, you perform a masking. So that is, for security against an adversary that makes D observation, what you're doing is that you're splitting your sensitive data into D plus one random variables. So that's good for uh, protecting your sensitive value X, but what you want as a cryptographer is that you want to compute on this value X. So you want to, you want to compute a value, uh, function F of X, and you want still this operation to be secure. So you want to deep privacy of this function. You want to compute F of X from these shares in such a way that no adversary can once again get information about what's going on. Formally, what you want is that you want uh, that for two different inputs, x and y, you want the distributions of both uh, sets of observations made by an attacker to be the same. So how is this achieved in the state of the art? Well, this is achieved through private circuits. So private circuits are just circuits that implement a certain function from one set to, to another. And the idea is that you take your input x, you put this input x into an encoder, which is a small function, if you want, a small circuit. Uh, you, pr you put some randomness and you get some output, which you plug into a big circuit, which is uh, also fed with uh, randoms. And then you put the result of that into a decoder, which is going to give you uh, your, the evaluation of your function f into this point. So what you're asking to the private circuit, obviously you're asking him to be correct. That is, for any random, in fact, you want uh, to get the correct evaluation of your function. And you want it to be deep private. Of course, it's in the name. So in this paper, we looked at a particular private circuit. We looked at a particular function, sorry, and that private circuit that implements it, which is this one, that's simply the end of two bits. Why is that? Because the XOR actually is very, very well studied in the literature. And the end is the next step. As, as you may know, uh, every Boolean function can be, ex can be expressed as uh, XOR and end. So if we know how to uh, construct private circuits for XOR and private circuits for end, then we have a good shot at um, constructing private circuits for bigger Boolean functions. So in the state of the art, uh, all private circuits that compute this function are of these forms. You take your encoder. So the encoder is simply a Boolean sharing of A and a Boolean sharing of B. And then you compute all the cross products between this vector of A and these vectors of shares of B. OK, so you have all these cross products. And then you plug it into a circuit. And the particularity of this circuit is that it's only XOR gates. So you're only XORing your cross products with some randomness. And once you got that, well, you have some output to the circuit, and you just have to XOR them to get the product of uh, A and B. So we looked at this circuit, and we looked at what's going on. So you have this input, you have this output, and you also have a lot of randomness. And the question that came to our mind rather quickly was, 
how much randomness is needed to achieve this, to achieve the security of such a scheme? And this is a very natural question, because in, in cryptography, you use randomness everywhere. You use it in your keys, you use it in your RSM prime factors, you use it when you want to sign something, and you ask it a lot, you know, you ask it to be uniformly distributed, you ask it to be independent, so you're a bit dreaming about perfect randomness. But where does it come from? Where, where does randomness come from? Well, what you want in the real world is that you want to capture uh, physical unpredictability. So what is that? Where, well, for example, you want to capture toggling of gates, you want to capture maybe quantum phenomena that you cannot predict. And in real life, what this means uh, in practice is that you want uh, special hardware that can do that, which is costly. And the accumulation of entropy can be slow. And you can even get biased or uneven distribution. So sometimes what this means is that you even have to retreat your, um, your randomness by making, putting it to an AES after that. So it's even more costly and it's even slower. So my point here is that randomness should be considered as a resource, like space and time. So with that in mind, we have this idea that randomness is costly, and we have this idea that we still want um, a private circuit. So how do we conciliate these two, these two approaches? So we looked at this question, how much randomness is needed, and we looked into the state of the art. And actually, in the state of the art, the best construction that we could find was surprisingly in the seminal paper of Ishai, Sai, and Wagner, where they introduced the model. So they looked at it, and they proposed the construction, which was uh, at about d square on two randomness. And after that, there have been improvement of the schemes, of course, but it was on time or on uh, space but never of randomness complexity. So in this work, we try to tackle this issue. We ask ourselves what's uh, needed to compute such a circuit and what can we really achieve in practice and in theory. So these are the main contribution of the paper. I won't be able to talk about all of them. So the first one actually is that we looked at our problem and we characterized it in terms of linear algebra. So we proved that the problem of deep privacy can be seen as a linear algebra problem. Then we proposed an upper bound, which is quasi-linear in the, in the order of security. We also proved a lower bound, which is linear in the order of security. And then for very practical uh, D, we proposed some constructions. So we constructed some private circuits that are actually secure and actually private, private, private for small d. So we actually reach our lower bound here for small d's and implementation that can be seen in real life. Then we have a generic construction for greater d's uh, if you want to go higher in your construction. And the, this halves ISW randomness cost. So this halves the cost of randomness that is in the state of the art. Then we had some results on the composition of these circuits, which means that you can plug together several circuits that compute the end to make them compute a bigger function, like maybe a, an S-box or a whole AES. And finally, we proposed an automatic tool that looks at some constructions and that tries to find flaws in it. So I'm going to swipe through the underlined proposition and I'm going to try to give you um, an idea of the techniques that were involved. So the first observation you can make when you see this circuit actually is that any value that is being manipulated here, any Y value or any uh, thing, any probe that an attacker can make has this form. Obviously, because we are only performing XORs. So any value on any Y is of this form, that is a XOR of some of your cross products, XOR, a XOR of certain random bits. And you can write it in a matricial way. If you write it in a matricial way, it looks like that, so it's simply a vector A times a matrix M, M times a vector B, so your, vector, your matrix M just tells you well, I'm just picking this share and this share and this share and this share. 
And so a vector s times your vector r with your vector s only telling you, uh, well, I'm picking this random, this random, and this random. So any one value can be written like that, and trivially, any sum of this value can be written like that, because you're only XORing them. So this is the observation on which we based our algebraic characterization. <coughs> Sorry. So the algebraic characterization uh, is based on the condition that we defined, which we called condition one. And we showed that this condition is actually very tightly related to the privacy of the circuit. So the condition reads like that. Uh, a set of probes satisfy our condition if and only if, when you make this sum, you make the randoms disappear. So A times M times B, no more randoms. And you have the all one vector in the row or in the colon space of your matrix M. And what we were able to show with this condition is that we have an equivalence between the deep privacy of our circuit C and the non-existence of a set of probes of cardinality less than D that satisfies it. In other words, what we showed is that if you have a set of probes that, has, that satisfies this condition, you have an attack on your circuit. And conversely, all the attacks are, are probes of this form that satisfies condition one. So I'm going to give you a bit of uh, an insight of the sketch of proof, at least from one way. So let's assume you have this set of probes that satisfies this condition. So you, get, you got rid of your randomness, and you have the all one vector in your colon space of M. Well, first of all, since you got rid of your randomness, what you want to know is uh, if you can retrieve some information on A or on B. So the first observation you can make since the all one vector is in the colon space of M is that there exists a particular vector B prime such, such as M times B prime is the all one vector, obviously. But then look at what hap what's happening in your sum of probe. If you compute A times M times B, when this is the all one vector, well, you retrieve the secret value A. Otherwise, you retrieve, if, uh, if M times B prime is not the all one vector, you retrieve some randomness. So that's what we show here. The probability that your sum of probe is equal to your secret value is one half when M times B not the all one vector, and it's one when M times B is the all one vector. So what this shows is that you have a bias uh, in the, random, in the um, distribution of this variable. Particularly, it shows that the probability that your sum of probe being equal to A is higher than the probability that your sum of probe is being equal to one minus A. So this means you have a bias, so this means that your circuit is not private. So you have an attack. The other way is way, way more complicated. We have it in the appendix of our paper. I won't be able to uh, go through it right now. So we have the, this algebraic characterization, and now we looked at the upper bound. So what's in the state of the art? Well, in the state of the art, we have the randomness complexity of ISW, and the randomness complexity of ISW is uh, d square. But we don't really need a quadratic complexity. Actually, what we were able to show is that there exists a deep private circuit for multiplication that requires d log d randoms. So once again, I'm going to show you a sketch of proof uh, about that. So sadly, it's a probabilistic method, so we weren't able to actually construct such circuits. Uh, the idea is that you take a class of algorithm that you're gonna um, define like so. So you take a lot of random bits, r, and you construct linear combinations of, uh, of these things, of these bits. So when you do that, uh, you set coefficient alpha with zero and one. And you take the class of algorithm that have different alpha, and the construction is as follows. So you take all your cross products, which I'm gonna make in color to make it simpler, and in between, you're just gonna put uh, your, randoms, uh, your random linear combinations, so like it. And of course, to ensure correctness, what you want is uh, that the last one uh, is equal to the sum of the other one in, in order to uh, get rid of all the randoms. 
So you have this construction, and what we were able to show actually is for R high enough, the probability of one of these algorithms to be secure is non-zero. So since, uh, one of, since the probability of one of these algorithms is non-zero, this means that there exists one algorithm that is deprivate. So we have a security here, here for some algorithm, but we don't know how to construct it. So let me now talk about lower bounds. So lower bounds, our results are rather intuitive, but they are not quite trivial to show. So actually, we proved that we need linear uh, randomness to achieve this uh, privacy. So for the case of t uh, higher than 2, you need at least d random bits. And for the case of uh, d higher than 3, we need at least d plus 1 random bits. Uh, so we, we have been able to construct some, uh, some algorithm that actually reach these bounds for d until 4, I think. And we prove them uh, using uh, EasyCrypt, from our tool EasyCrypt. Speaking of which, uh, we actually built an automatic tool for finding attacks in uh, such construction. Why is that? Because when we were working on our construction, we tried to um, prove them using EasyCrypt a lot of the time. And for big orders of security, we couldn't achieve um, an answer, a quick answer. So what we, what we did uh, is that we actually build ourselves uh, an automatic tool taking advantage of the algebraic characterization that we defined in our paper. So this means that obviously our tool is very specific contrary to EasyCrypt that can deal with a much more larger and much larger um, problem set. But our tool is very specific, so it's much more efficient on our problem. So we based it on, on al our algebraic characterization, and it relies on coding theory, more particularly on information, information set decoding. But obviously, it's not perfectly sound. It's a random approach, a probabilistic approach, so he fi it finds flaws very efficiently, but it's not able to prove the security of your algorithm. However, it's much faster than your script-based approach, and it was very useful during your work to get rid of some flawed construction that we thought of. So here are the, the results of, uh, of our performance. So just to, to summarize our results, um, it was uh, ISW, so the state-of-the-art uh, randomness complexity, with our lower bounds in uh, a range. Then we uh, built a new construction that halves ISW randomness cost, which I didn't describe in this talk, but that is described in great length in the paper. And we also have a construction for small d's that actually reach the lower bound that we defined. So thank you for your attention. Uh, time for a question. Thank you for your presentation. The algebraic representation, you don't take the input, A and B. Why is the reason for that? Well, actually the, um, okay, actually we focused on this type of circuit to make our proof. Um, so that's why we don't take A and B as, a, as, a, as inputs in our, in our algebraic uh, characterization. But we can also do it with A and B, but it's in the paper, actually. So you have to, to read. We have a much a stronger algebraic characterization that which comes later, uh, which is used, actually, to prove the, um, the contraposite of this property, this theorem. All right, uh, we have a three-minute track switch break. Thank both speakers in the section. <laughs>